But what so, we're trying to do is we're trying to bring Americans up to speed yeah. on the complexities of, of the world that we grew up with. My father fought in World War II. He was gone for two years. Uh, Liz's father was involved with uh, welding Liberty ships in Brooklyn Harbor in the 1940s. When we ended up uh, in the 90s trying to tell people, especially after 93, the first World Trade Tower bombing, we said, you know, Americans, wake up. We have a really serious problem here. There are things happening in your name, and you're all just asleep. And it all had to do with what was going on vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and Pakistan in the region. We couldn't get anybody's attention at all. And what we're trying to do is really help people understand the paradigms of which Afghanistan is one of many victims. And, and certainly right now, one of the, you know, the greatest victims of it, and certainly one of the longest lived victims of it. And that is certainly, I think, what is reflected in the, the, the two books that we have written on it. But you know, this, is, this really has been a challenge for us, is to get Americans' attention to the issue, quite frankly. That if the United States had, had signed the SALT II, if the United States had passed the SALT II agreement, not signed it, President Carter actually did sign it, if the United States had actually shown the Soviet Union that we were willing to sit down at the table and negotiate these issues, the Soviets never would have invaded Afghanistan. Paul Warnke told us that, who negotiated that treaty. So these are the things we're trying to explain to Americans, that the automatic functions that we just keep having to repeat again and again and again, go to the ballot box and repeat these things, it is not about Afghanistan, it's about us. I wonder if you'd comment upon, upon this uh, rather confusing message that the United States appears to be sending where we would sell Aegis, Navy Aegis destroyers to Saudi Arabia, who is helping to arm and train and, I guess, uh, you know, support uh, these uh, so-called terrorists that we're fighting. It's all, it's all very kind of uh, mixed up. This is what we were dealing with uh, in 1979 when we began that documentary uh, on arms race and the economy of delicate balance. And a lot of people uh, in the Boston community from World War II and the formation of the Cold War that worked on the Manhattan Project was still at universities around the Boston area were very happy to tell us about what the real story was regarding the Cold War and, and the use of the military industrial complex and the high technology, development of high technology weapons. And uh, that's when Galbraith actually, John Kenneth Galbraith actually said, he said, you know, he said, we've already become in many ways like the Soviet system. He said, we've become their opposite. He said, we've rigidified things. He said, this military industrial complex is essentially functioning in, in social welfare like the Politburo and the Soviet military. They get what they want. Their hawks appeal to our hawks. And he said, back and forth. He said, that's the game that's being played. He says, what we have to do is we have to decommission the hawks and get it down to uh, a, a peaceful coexistence with these people and work it out in, in terms of negotiation. Of course, that's when we saw the, the issue regarding uh, uh, what happened in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan opened the door. If you look back to the Reagan administration, that was an opportunity where all kinds of things that were basically built into the American system to protect American workers, to protect American industry, were shifted over. And a lot of those, those jobs started get sh getting shifted. They'd already begun before that. But they were en, en masse. Jobs and industries started getting shipped overseas. And that was just no, it, was, it was a globalist agenda, essentially, that came in. But nobody was told that. We were all told that it was a nationalist agenda and that we were going to be strong by building more weapons. So now where are we? 2011, and the only decent jobs that are left are basically government jobs that are, being, are not private enterprise at all. They're government jobs that are being paid for by tax dollars and, uh, and therefore uh, weapons of war. And we have reached a level with, the wep with those weapons of war where uh, we, are, we are at a crossroads. There are many reasons why we call the book Crossing Zero. Metaphorically, we are really at a very, uh, a very dangerous point in our evolution as not just a civilization but as a species. Uh, there was a report that was done by, by the British military about six months ago that's just been re reaffirmed in American media uh, about the, uh, the unstoppability of turning these, these drone wars into uh, an automatic, automata function. Uh, there is now software available, uh, face recognition software, DNA software, the sensors that are available to be put onto these drones, whereby their alleged targets can be determined via the computer and assassinated without even the involvement of a human being. So 
this is a little bit different than even where we were in 1979. We were at the beginning of that trajectory then. We're, we're in the payoff to it now. I, I, for one, would suggest that um, if right now all troops were brought home, we would still not have any solution that would really solve the fundamental problems for Americans right now who are facing, obviously, the ravages in the economy that really are the product of what we have now, what we were trying to help people understand is that the ravages today in the economy that are recognized as, as a result of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq actually was really the product of the Vietnam War. And, and that was on our, what we recognized. That was our last opportunity as a nation, as, a, as, as a, a national economy, to really reinvest in the civilian economy, to actually move away from our competition with the Soviet Union as a military competition to a more, a more civilian competition. This was the whole goal at the time. And what I think what we really were trying to show you is how that got derailed. So we're, at, we're now at the end of the line, let's put it that way. We really have no choice but to change. That's why we said the Soviet Union went, died a miserable death because it didn't have the ability to see its own internal dysfunction and disintegration while it was happening and work with it, okay? They pretended they could go on forever, and so were we. So it's, it's simply a matter of coming to terms that we have to change, or we will, we will go down like every other empire. I, I don't think... Well, in terms of the security issue, I don't think at this point that there is any chance that the United States is going to pull out of Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. I believe that there is a, that there is a permanent commitment to, uh, to build bases there, to stay there. Enormous bases are being built. Uh, Bagram, which was, a, you know, which was a Soviet air base uh, during the 1980s, has become a major facility. The U.S. has built an enormous prison there. Uh, that's how they're solving their, their detention problem now. They take people that they pick up around the world and they bring them to Bagram. That's, uh, that's the next, instead of having to bring them to Guantanamo. That's how they solve the Guantanamo issue. So even though that's not completely done yet either. Um, another aspect of this is, is that uh, the, a lot of this stuff has been privatized. There are enormous amounts of uh, military personnel who are being dismissed from the military and hiring on with DynCorp and Blackwater and these various other groups. In fact, I think Blackwater is actually setting up an army, I believe it's in Qatar, uh, in order to basically provide for probably protection of these, uh, these ships, these Aegis cruisers that are being sold to the Saudis. So there's a, an entire agenda that's, uh, that's been in the works for years. And what we're now seeing is, is that as American people, as American voters, as American taxpayers, we don't have any direct in, in, input into it. Our foreign policy establishment has always been a very rarefied uh, uh, select group. It's a country club uh, of, of people who are trained from generation to generation to generation. Hillary Clinton just brought uh, Wisner into the, in, in to help her with some foreign policy issues. Uh, Frank Wisner was uh, the original lead with the CIA back in the 19, late 40s, early 50s, the creation of it. You see this happening again and again, generation upon generation, protégés upon protégés, coming in and installing the same system, the same objectives. In this particular case, the objectives are control of oil pipelines across uh, Central Asia and, uh, and basically holding the choke points with our military uh, doctrine in order to stop uh, China and, uh, and India from becoming a, uh, uh, competitors uh, in terms of control. Uh, if you look at the 1992 defense guidance that was written, I don't know if, you've, if, if you can get the completely unclassified version of it, but look online for the 1992 defense guidance that was put together by uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Zami Halizad for the original uh, Bush administration, and it will give you an idea. It's a full spectrum dominance. The whole idea is, is that we are not going to be competed with by anybody else. We're not going to let anybody else come up to our level in, in militarily around the world. Uh, it's, it's a it's been a very complicated situation uh, for many, many years. Uh, the United States is shifting its position of support for Pakistan, it has been doing that now for a number of years, towards India uh, and, and as a partner in South Central Asia. That brings up the issue that Pakistan is, a, uh, it, is pretty much a, uh, uh, a, a player with China. China supports Pakistan's interests. Uh, Pakistan, China also has interests in Afghanistan. They're, they've created the world's largest uh, copper mine, the ANAC mine, okay, which is on the Pakistani border. So uh, there are all kinds of plans for China to develop uh, the port of Gwadar, as an example, and put a rail line 
that would that would take it from the Persian Gulf all the way up into China, uh, and a spur off to Afghanistan. So there are huge development projects here. These are trillion dollar projects over many many decades uh, that are involved here. So. The issue comes down to, I mean, Charles Kogan, the, direct, the chief of the Directorate of Operations from 1979 to 1984, recently put, a, put an article out where he basically said that Pakistan should never have been created in the first place. Pakistan should never, India should never have been divided. There was a, there was a, a relationship between Hindus and Muslims uh, in that time period, uh, of, over the history, the, the traditional history over, over hundreds of years in, in, uh, in India. And that was changed, that was altered by Cold War politics in 1947. And, and that is an issue that has never been addressed, as has the line, the Durand line, the line that was created by Britain in 1893 that separates Afghanistan from Pakistan. The Afghans never accepted that line. So this is another issue that the Afghans have wanted brought to the international court. They want it brought to the United Nations and work all these things out. All the indigenous peoples that are not just Pashtuns that have a problem with what's going on right now in Afghanistan and Pakistan. There are Baluchs, there are Sindhis, uh, just the way the, uh, 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 the uh, creation of Bangladesh occurred uh, with the, uh, back in 1972, I believe the war was. So you have an issue there with the Bengalis. Uh, I would also like to add that uh, when it comes to Pakistan, having been created in 1947, almost from the day of its creation, Pakistan has had a pretty special <coughs> relationship with the United States. It really came in and was, uh, was helped by the British uh, intelligence set up, Pakistani intelligence. They worked very closely to make sure that Pakistani intelligence and the military really were almost separated at some level from the very beginning from the nation itself. And a lot of the politics that are, that are, in, tr are in trouble today in Pakistan has to do with that, that fact that it has never had the chance since its own creation to really have its own, you know, get, get its own ground effectively. And that, I think, is part of its paranoia with India. And, but also, you have to realize that it views Afghanistan negatively, partly because <coughs> of the fact that it knows that those Pashtun areas, the tribal lands, are in, really, the, those, those people who are on the other side of the Durand line on what's called Pakistan don't recognize it. So Pakistan does have a very, um, you know, obviously, they, 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 they are concerned about their own existence. It's obviously very late now in the game. But I think what Paul is saying is fundamental to understanding that these things have got to be expressed. Indigenous people who have been impacted have to have a chance to be heard. These are all the things that we feel have to be in place. The role the United States should be playing should be as an assist to the region, but that is not what we're getting. The United States is going in there as a, an empire, basically, a colonial, with a colonial attitude towards Afghanistan that was no different than the British Empire in the 19th century. Uh, this is a very volatile situation that we are, no, it's always been a volatile situation, but we're no longer at the point where there, we can continue to make adjustments to it. We've got to the edge of a cliff. Uh, Pakistan has far more uh, uh, to look towards China as an example. China comes into Afghanistan, China goes into Pakistan, they spend money, they put people to work. Uh, that's what people really care about. That's the bottom line. And that's what's happening here. That's what's going on with the Bath Iron Works. I mean, it's the, it's the jobs. If you can't support your local population with the money that's coming in, what do you do? Where do you go? Well, I mean, this is a country, the end of the day, if you're a British citizen, the end of the day, you've got Mother England. The end of the day, everyone came here to the United States because of economic opportunities. If there are no economic opportunities here and the jobs are every place else in the world, what are we here for? Who are we? What are we doing? These are the kinds of things that are not getting into the political dialogue in the United States.